Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, Precise Detection of T-Cell Receptors Using RNA-Seq with Unique Molecular Indexing, presented by Dr. Samuel Ruley, Senior Global Product Manager, RNA Profiling, Kyogen. I'm Xavier Gutierrez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Kyogen. For more information about our sponsor, please visit www.kyogen.com. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ruley. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you very much, uh, Xavier. Um, in today's presentation, we're going to talk about using RNA sequencing to look at and profile T-cell receptors. This is a very exciting field that has a lot of different applications. Some of these applications revolve around the field of immuno oncology, looking at how the immune system can fight off cancer cells. It also revolves around T cell development and immunology in general, as well as different applications from life sciences through clinical research. For today's presentation, I'm going to focus on one of the techniques for sequencing T cell receptors and why you would want to actually do this within uh, the context of profiling and immune response. As a legal disclaimer, the kits and products that we are going to present today are intended for molecular biology applications. These products are intended for, are not intended for the diagnosis, prevention, or treatment of disease. For up-to-date licensing information and product-specific disclaimers, feel free to download the respective Kygen Kit Handbook or User Manual. These kit handbooks and user manuals are available on Kygen.com or can be requested from Kygen Technical Services or your local distributor. As an introduction into T cells and T cell receptors, T cells are one of the many different immune um, cells that we have. And T cells are very uh, unique in that they respond and protect us from specific threats. T cells do this by recognizing specific antigens in complexes using what's called the T cell receptor. T cells express different receptor genes and combinations of these receptor genes determine the um, affinity for specific antigens. So down here on the bottom of our screen, I've depicted two different types of T cells. These T cells will, will express different genes, um, termed the alpha, beta, or the gamma and delta subunit. In a particular T cell, you will find that they have either alpha and beta genes or gamma and delta genes. When we look at the function of these T cell receptors, they will function as heterodimers, and you will find a specific alpha and beta subunit or a gamma and delta subunit. During the um, formation of these T cell receptors, there is a dramatic change in the genomic DNA, and it undergoes somatic recombination. The T cell receptors can be broken down into what's called the variable regions and the constant regions. The constant regions are the same for all T cell receptors. They are um, spliced together during um, RNA transcription, and they are a pretty boring part of the molecule. But when we look at the variable region, this is where the actual excitement is. And it's the variable region and this variability that allows T cell receptors to have a tremendous um, number of different recombination events that allow the right recombinated event to uh, recognize a specific um, antigen. Within the 
DNA cassettes that get recombined, they're termed different uh, names. So we have the V region, we have the J region, and we have the D region. The alpha and gamma receptors will use the V and J regions, while the beta and delta receptors will use the V, D, and J regions. When researchers are interested in looking at the immune repertoire, often they need to think about which particular type of the T cell receptors they want to characterize. There's been a lot of work that's been done over the last 15 years that is focused on looking at recombination and the um, immune repertoire of just the PCR beta gene. This was done because this was recognized as one of the more highly expressed genes. We had good ways to detect this at the DNA level, and it really became the standard for probably the last uh, 10 or 15 years. However, recently, with the advent of much better RNA sequencing kits, researchers are now looking at the complete immune repertoire, which includes the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta receptors. And in the experiments that we'll be talking about today, when we define the immune repertoire, we'll be talking about looking at alpha, beta, gamma, and delta chains and trying to look at the proportion of these and how they change during different conditions. Within the different receptors, there are what's called the complementary determinant regions. These are termed CDR1, CDR2, and CDR3. The complementary determinant regions are the parts of the protein that will be in close contact with the antigen. And it's the CDR1, CDR2, and CDR3 regions, which are thought to determine the specificity of a receptor for a particular antigen. For the last 10 or 15 years, when we were focusing on the beta receptor, we focused on a very small part of the variable region termed the CDR3 region. However, with the sequencing technology that we have today, we can focus on the CDR3 region or we can focus on the complete molecule using much longer reads. So with the experiments that we're talking about today, we will be using the same um, RNA sequencing library kit and determine and determine and uh, based on how we set up our sequencing machine, we can focus on only the CDR3 region of the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta um, subunits, or we can focus on looking at the complete molecule, which gives us the CDR1, CDR2, and CDR3 regions. A nice picture of and summary of the different regions domains is shown here. On the right-hand side of the screen, we have a T cell. The T cell is depicted in pink. On the left-hand side here, we have an antigen presenting cell. In between the antigen presenting cell and the T cell, we have the T cell receptor. Here, we're looking at the beta chain and the alpha chain. You can see the constant regions in blue, and you can see the beta subchain with the CDR3 region highlighted. In between the CDR3 region and the MHC, which is the major histo histocompatibility um, um, complex on the antigen presenting cell, we have the AG, which is the antigen. And what we're trying to depict here in the top picture is that it's the CDR3 region of the beta chain that is in close contact with the antigen. And knowing the specific um, peptide sequence that's there, which we can get from sequencing the RNA, can give us some insight into the um, peptides that are determining the affinity for the antigen. One of the exciting things with knowing what the T cell receptors are is that you can actually build out a chimeric um, artificial T cell that can express a specific receptor. And if you know what the antigen is, maybe something expressed on a cancer cell, you can actually build a T cell that would be able to go and identify the antigen and kill that cancer cell. On the bottom of the screen here, we're looking at the recombination of the DNA to define the RNA transcript that will be expressed. On the bottom here, we have the different V, D, and J regions that come together. In um, the beta subunit, there are 54 different V regions. There's a couple of different D regions and, uh, and about 13 different J regions, which can be recombined at the DNA level. These are transcribed into RNA. And then there's a splicing event that occurs in order for the constant region to be added back to the recombined DDJ RNA construct. When we're using RNA sequencing, what we often do is we capture the region starting from the C region through the J, D, and B region. And this is the region that we want to sequence in order to identify either the CDR, 
um, three region or the complete molecule based on shorter or longer reads. For sequencing, there's been a couple of different technologies that have been um, used to identify the T cell receptors. You can start by sequencing the DNA or you can start by sequencing the RNA. Sequencing the DNA is um, what a lot of researchers think of. This was one of the first techniques that was um, used for identifying the T cell receptor sequence. A lot of researchers think of using DNA because these samples are very easy to obtain. We can use biopsy samples from tissues, or we can even go and use um, preserved slides um, as starting material. DNA tends to be very stable. It tends to not be as damaged as much as RNA. Uh, in, in addition, um, since an individual cell may have only one copy of a successfully rearranged BDJ um, event, the DNA may reflect the quantity of a receptor better with the idea that the number of sequences that you see of a particular receptor, receptor coordinates um, with the number of cells that have that successful recombination. And you may be able to infer the number of T cells or the relative amount of T cells that are in that particular sample that you're starting with. Starting with RNA is a much newer approach. Um, T cell receptor mRNA templates are likely to be expressed at very high levels within a T cell. And we think by starting with RNA, this allows us to get much higher sensitivity, where if you have a um, small number of cells in a particular population, we can still capture that T cell receptor sequence. This is very important to have high sensitivity, especially if we're looking at um, minimal residual disease or trying to identify a T cell at a particular time point that has either been um, upregulated before or will be upregulated in the future. With RNA sequencing, this allows us to identify expressed T cell receptor sequences. Even though DNA undergoes the recombination, there could be recombination events that never get expressed within that particular cell. They can be uh, biological dead ends. But by capturing the RNA, we know that this um, RNA is going to be expressed and translated into protein, and it represents the true T cell receptor within the, in that particular cell. In addition, the relatively shorter length of T cell receptor mRNA templates allow for a very easy library construction method and it allows us to capture the complete VDJ region. And this means that we can identify not only the CDR3 region, but also the CDR1 and the CDR2 region. By identifying the CDR1 and CDR2 region, this allows us to have the complete um, complementary determinant regions of the receptor. And there is some interesting biology pointing out that CDR1 and CDR2 could play a particular role in a number of different diseases. The kit that we use at Kyogen and that I'm gonna talk about today in the rest of today's webinar is going to start with an RNA library seq preparation. In this particular workflow, we'll start with RNA. We will convert it over to cDNA. We'll do some manipulation of the cDNAs to, have, to add a unique molecular index and then complete out the RNA seq library for sequencing on a next gen sequencing instrument. To go through the individual workflow, the first thing that we do is we start with RNA. And then we use a pool of primers for gene-specific reverse transcription of the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta T cell receptor mRNAs. Typically, when we start this particular type of library preparation, we have isolated the um, RNA from our starting material. For this particular library, there's no need to do any sort of ribosomal uh, reduction or to enrich for mRNA. We can start with a total RNA, either from an enriched T cell population, for instance, if we're doing fluorescently activated or fax sorting, we can go through and take those cells and pop them open to isolate the RNA. Or we can go through and just start with a fraction of a uh, PBMC, or we can take a tumor, lyse it open, and look at infiltrating T cells. After the cDNA reaction, we're going to go through and we're going to um, clean up the DNA, we're gonna make double-stranded DNA, we're going to make the ends amendable to doing a ligation reaction. The next event is to do a ligation reaction. And during this ligation reaction, we're going to add back one of the sample index adapters. Within the sample index adapter, there are three different regions. One is a universal region that we'll use for future PCR steps. Another has a sample index in it, 
that is part of the sample index for the sequencing. And then another part shown here in green has a UMI or unique molecular index. The kit that we're talking about today uses unique molecular indexing as a way to solve for um, PCR amplification bias, as well as to do error correction and to know how much of a library that we're sequenced. If you're not familiar with unique molecular indexing, this is a technology that is currently being used in a lot of different NGS kits. For unique molecular indexing, what this does is it allows us to take a PCR fragment and to give it a unique molecular barcode. And this allows us to go through and to look at differences between the amplicons based on these molecular indexing. In the example I'm showing you on this screen here, we're looking at a typical amplicon sequencing library. On the left-hand side, you have five replicates of one transcript, and on the right-hand side, we have five unique transcripts of a gene. This is what your sequencing machine sees. It sees five red lines uh, for five replicates of a transcript or five red lines for five unique transcripts of a gene. It actually can't tell you the difference whether or not this was one sequence amplified five times or five sequences amplified one time. However, by adding back the unique molecular index, we can now go through and give each of these transcripts uh, its own barcode. On the left-hand side here, you can see that we've used a gray unique molecular index, and we can see that when we go through and count the number of grays, we have one gray. So this means that we have five replicates of one transcript. What probably happened here was that we captured one molecule and it was amplified five times during the library construction. On the right-hand side here, we can, you can see that we have five different colors for our unique molecular index. What happened here is that we captured five different RNA molecules and we sequenced each one one time. So by adding back the unique molecular index, we can go through and we can use this as a very quantitative way for amplicon sequencing. We can count the situation at left. We count up the number of unique molecular indexes as one. On the right-hand side, we can see now that we have five different molecules that are there. So by using unique molecular indexing, what this allows us to do is really to make targeted sequencing more accurate and more precise around the quantification of the number of molecules that we're sequencing. In addition, unique molecular indexing can also help us go through and look at the ability of detecting rare variants or rare transcripts that are there and separate things out from either PCR, library construction, or sequencing artifacts. In this particular example here, we're looking at the T cell receptor beta sequence. And you can see here, I've aligned the reads that are there. Shown here with a red asterisk is one read that has a different nucleotide sequence than the rest of these. Since when we go through and we build our libraries, we use both um, enzymatic as well as other methods of amplifying the um, RNA to cDNA and the DNA um, uh, throughout the library construction. There are places where enzymes, no matter how high fidelity they are, can introduce an artificial error. So in this particular instance here, if we were to go back and look at this, where we see a one nucleotide difference, we really don't often know whether this is a PCR sequencing artifact or is this actually a true low frequency sequence that's there, a unique clonotype that may actually be the secret to finding cancer. By adding the unique molecular indexes, before we do any amplification, we can go through and align all of the sequences that have the same UMI and actually go through and do error correction on the sequencing and PCR steps during library construction. So at the bottom here, we have sequencing with the UMI. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see we have the yellow UMI. And when we align all the sequences that came from that, you can see that only one of the sequences has the red asterisk or the red nucleotide difference. So that indicates that that's a sequencing error. Whereas on the right-hand side, you can see that the UMI, the red UMI, all of the sequences have the same red asterisk, which means that that's actually a true nucleotide that was sequenced there. When we add the UMIs before any amplification, any downstream artifacts that are introduced can actually be removed, giving you much higher quality data. In addition, when we do our data analysis, we can now introduce unique ways to filter the data. So in experiments that we often do, we want to make sure that we have both biological and technical um, reproducibility um, across this. 
So often when we go through and we look at our final data, we need to make sure that we only call clonotypes where we have three UMIs, which means we have three separate capture events or we captured three separate RNA molecules. And then we can go through and count the number of times we sequenced each individual UMI. So if we go through and we say we need a clonotype that has three UMIs and has been sequenced only three times, that means that we have nine independent observations that that is actually a true sequence. And this is one of the ways that we can bring much more accuracy to identifying rare T cell receptors. In addition, when we do sequencing, a lot of times when we build these libraries, we actually don't sequence the entire library. Often with RNA sequencing, we don't know how many copies of a particular transcript we're looking at, and we need to guess how many reads we need to use for a particular library. This can often lead to either over-sequencing or under-sequencing. If we over-sequence a particular library, the more sequencing you do, the more chance you have of incorporating an error into the um, um, transcript that you're looking at. In addition, if you under-sequence a library, you actually didn't look at all the data that's there, and you can actually have a very important piece of the puzzle missing. One of the things that we do with the UMIs is that we can gauge whether or not we've sequenced all the molecules that we put onto the sequencing machine. We can look at the mean reads per UMI. If we see that the mean read per UMI is somewhere around five, that means that we sequence every UMI at least five times, and that is usually a good indication that the entire library that we put on the sequencing machine has been sequenced, meaning that we didn't leave any of the data to be discovered. One of the examples of this is shown here with the rarefication plots that we use in our data analysis. With a rarefication plot, we can actually mathematically predict the number of potential receptors that were there. And then we can overlay this with the actual sequencing data to see how much of that potential immune repertoire we covered in the sample that we're looking at. After we've added back our unique molecular index through that ligation reaction, now it's time to complete the rest of the lot. To capture the gene-specific T cell receptor alpha, beta, gamma, and delta sequences, we use a gene-specific pool of primers. This allows us to go through and to hone in and to have a very targeted panel. This allows us also to dedicate most of the reads during that sequencing run to identifying the novel alpha, beta, gamma, and delta subunits you have there. Then we do a quick bead cleanup. We then move to the sample indexing to add back the last sample index using a simple PCR reaction. We do one final bead cleanup, and then we have a sequencing ready library. We typically quantitate this using either a PCR method, a bioanalyzer, or some other method to look at both the size distribution as well as the quantity of the library that we have. Once we've done that, we can then move on to denaturing and loading this onto a next gen sequencing instrument. As part of a complete workflow at Kaigen, we've um, put together a sample to insight solution. So for sample isolation, we typically start with isolating RNA. If we're starting with cells or tissue, this would be an rna kit. If we're starting with blood samples, this would be the PAX gene um, RNA isolation kit. For the mRNA enrichment, we have two different types of kits that we've developed. We have a kit for starting with human T cells, and we have a kit for starting with mouse T cells. For sample indexing, we have several different solutions. Um, these depend on the number of samples and the type of sequencing machine that you're going to use. Shown here are the solutions for using an Illumina next-gen sequencing machine. We have a 12 index kit, which allows you to run 12 samples together at one time. And then we also have a 96 index kit, both the A, B, C, and D version, which will allow you to run up to 384 samples in a single lane on an Illumina sequencing machine. For library QC, we often use a qPCR method that is very accurate for the complete library being constructed. For next-gen sequencing run, we often run this on either a MySeq, NextSeq, HiSeq, or other Illumina sequencing platforms. And then for bioinformatics, what we do is we've developed out a web-based tool where you can upload your raw FASTQ file. The web-based tool will go through, will interpret the sequencing information, and then give you a final report. It will tell you how many receptors, what type of receptor, the nucleotide sequence of the receptor, the protein sequence of the receptor, and then the clonotype um, based on international standards. 
The next couple of slides are going to go through some performance data and application data that we've generated here to show you how we are typically using the kit. For the first example of the performance data, these, this is uh, an experiment that was done in collaboration with a group of researchers. Um, where we took and looked at the concordance of T cell clonotyping using uh, FACs or fluorescently activated cell sorting with antibodies versus what you would see when you used RNA sequencing data. In this particular experiment, we're sorting T cells. The T cells that are being sorted, um, first they will be sorted for T cells, and then they will be clonotyped using antibodies, and this will tell us the type of T cell receptors that are there. Some of the T cells that were sorted and were not clonotyped were used, and we isolated RNA from them. We built RNA sequencing libraries using 10 nanograms or 25 nanograms of total RNA, which represents about 1,000 or 2,500 T cells. Here I'm summarizing the data. Um, on the left-hand side here, we have the fax data, and then we have the 10 nanograms and the 25 nanograms. And what I'm showing you here is the clonotype. So we have the VB, um, the beta chain three with the uh, clonotype shown there. And then the numbers are the percentages of that clonotype in that particular sample. So for example, on the first line here, we have the TR beta V28 clonotype. And we saw that this was 33% of the T cells in the fax sample. 30% of the cells using RNA sequencing in 10 nanograms, and about 35% of the total population using 25 nanograms. In pink here, what I've done is to highlight that the major clonotypes that were um, discovered using the FACTS machine were confirmed with RNA sequencing, and that there is a very high concordance um, between both of the methods. We see that we get very similar percentages of those clonotypes that are identified by FACs are shown in RNA sequencing, and that the complete immune repertoire can be characterized by RNA sequencing and is very similar to what you would be doing with FACs. As we dug down deeper into the data, we started looking at um, plots that look like this. What we're looking at here is the correlation, again, of the T cell sequencing versus the cytometry. On the y-axis here, we have the um, T cell receptor beta, where we're focusing only on the beta change here, where we're looking at the count using the unique molecular index, and we're comparing this to the frequencies by using the fax sorting on the x-axis. Here you can see the linear line here, which is showing us the concordance. In red, we are identifying, um, or actually on the bottom of the screen here, we're looking here at three different um, clonotypes that had um, antibody cross-reactivity. These particular clonotypes are very similar in their peptide sequence, and it's been known for a while that these antibodies are very promiscuous and will not identify these as a single clonotype, but rather as a pool. We didn't see these present in the RNA sequencing data. Um, this is most likely because the RNA sequencing data is looking at the particular sequences that are there, and we're not fooled by antibodies not working properly. Close on the x-axis here, we identified five of these different dots in red. These are five novel clonotypes that we are identified with RNA sequencing that were not able to be identified using the FAX method because there are no antibodies available to identify these particular clonotypes. One of the advantages of switching from a FAX method over to an RNA sequencing method, especially for discovery research, is that we can go through and discover all the clonotypes that are there, which can actually lead us in new avenues or help us stratify the samples that we're looking at a little bit differently. We recently um, took this data and put together a publication that was looking at the T cell analysis of two vast and shared melanoma uh, samples, where we're looking at the commonality as well as specific features of a couple of different populations. And in this paper that was done with a collaboration with um, Sylvan Simon and Natalie Labari from um, INSERM and the University of Nantes, we went through and we looked at the concordance between fax data as well as with the um, targeted RNA sequencing kit that we're talking about today. And we saw very high concordance. And if you're interested in looking at the experiments and repeating these, you can download this open access paper and see how this was done. One of the questions that we often get when we're looking at T cell receptors is how sensitive is the detection or can I really find a needle in a haystack? 
with a lot of the methods that are based around cell counting and cell sorting, we're looking at individual cells and the fluorescence intensity, which is often proportional to the number of receptors on the surface of that particular T cell. And we can often go through and look at the um, data and say we had a certain proportion of receptors that were positive or negative for different types of markers. With this next performance data I'm going to present here, what we're looking at is the ability to identify a particular T cell receptor in the background of normal PBMCs. So what we started with were two donors of normal with normal PBMCs. Um, we're looking at um, just a normal blood draw here, and we've put two donors together to really increase the diversity of the samples that we're looking at. And then we took the Jercat cell line. The Jercat cell line is a T cells um, clonal cell line that we can grow up in our laboratory. The T cell Jercat cell line that we're using has one known alpha and beta clone. And then we did a spike in experiment. We would start with 8 million of the cells, 8 million cells from our donors, from our PBMC, and then add back different per percentages of the Jercat cell. And the idea is, can we detect 1%, um, 0.1%, 0.01% of the Jercat T cell receptor in the background of these PBMCs? We built RNA sequencing libraries with a different uh, amount of PBNCs. So what I'm showing you here is on the y-axis, the percentages, and then I'm showing you two different bars here. I'm showing you the reads that map back to the T cell receptor, and then the reads that are usable for chronotype calling. And then on the x-axis here, we're looking at the input of the PBNC RNA. We're looking at the complete immune repertoire here, not focusing on an individual sequence. With the RNA sequencing library kit, we can see that 90% of the total reads will map back to the T cell receptor alpha, beta, gamma, or delta gene, which shows very high specificity and accuracy of the kit, which allows you to get the most out of the number of samples that you're running at one time. However, about 65% of the total reads are usable for the um, BDJ um, clonotyping. The other reads that we throw away often contain introns in the splice uh, variants. When we're going through and you think about the life cycle of RNA, you have RNA that is transcribed, and then it goes through several processing steps before it's transformed into mRNA, which will actually be translated into protein. When you're doing RNA sequencing, you actually do capture unspliced RNA that would be resident within the nucleus or has been just um, released from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And when we capture those unspliced or RNAs that are truncated, we can't use those for chronotype calling. Here we're looking at the duplicate of building different libraries by different technicians. This is to show the robustness of the kit. If you build different libraries on different days or different technicians build the same libraries, you should get a very linear correlation between that. And that's exactly what we see with the T cell receptor here. What we're looking at in the top are 2,000 clones that were called with the um, um, two different libraries. And then on the bottom here, what we're looking at is the top 2,000 clones, where we've really zoomed into that blob that you see around the X, Y axis to show that you see a very linear correlation when you run the same samples with two different libraries, which is very important if you're trying to do reproducible science. The next couple of slides here are going through and looking at the dilution experiment and looking at tracking the alpha and beta subunits of the Jercat. Um, this is to show you that the Jercat clone could be detected in all of the different samples down to 0.01%, and that the Jercat clone abundance is highly correlated with the number um, of the Jercat cells that we started with. This is to confirm the earlier observations that we showed that RNA sequencing is very quantitative and that the expression level that you see of the clonotype is proportioned to the number of cells that you have there. This is very important when you're looking at trying to identify maybe the number or the whether a T cell is infiltrating into a particular sample. The more clonotypes you see, the more of that cells that are there within that sample. Lastly, we've gone through and we started to summarize some of the um, data that you'll see in the report that you get out of our T cell receptor um, data analysis portal that we have on chiogen.com. What I'm summarizing here are the top clones. So we're looking at the T cell receptor alpha based on the percentages of the Jercat and the rank within that particular sample. We have the clonotype that was called there. 
And then on the right-hand side, we have the number of raw reads, and then we have the number of unique molecular indexes that are there. You can see that in the first sample, this is where we had 10% jerk cat spiked into the 8 million cells that were there. We had 751,000 reads that aligned back to this, and then we had 107,000 UMIs. Remember that the unique molecular index is the number of times we capture a unique molecule, while the reads are the total number of times that we're rereading the same sample. So in this particular example, each individual UMI was on average read about seven times, meaning that we have very high confidence in the sequence that we're looking at. As we look and we dilute down the jerkat cell more and more, we can see that when we get down to 0.01%, the T cell receptor alpha is now the 10th uh, most abundant receptor within that population. We have 1,300 reads with 217 UMIs, meaning that we're reading the uh, one molecule over multiple times. And when we look at the beta chain, we see very similar data. We can see that we can identify the T cell receptor beta down to 0.01%, which gives us 457 reads with 60 UMIs. One of the common questions that we get around the UMI technologies that we use at Kyogen is how many UMIs do you really need to see to have high confidence in the particular data set that you're looking at? And often, if we read the same UMI three to five times, we have very high confidence that that's actually a true um, sequence, and it's a true molecule that we captured during the RNA sequencing library. So it's not necessary to see the same molecule hundreds or thousands of times, but if we see a UMI and we sequence it five times, we believe that that's a true um, sequence in our experiments. The next slide here that we're looking at is a visualization of the T cell receptor in the background. So in the upper left-hand corner here, we're looking at the 10% jerk at that um, on the y-axis there, we're looking at the percentages. So that tall bar there is the jerk at um, VJ um, paired that is being expressed there. In S2 is the 1% jerk cat, and here you can still see that one tall bar that we see in the 10% jerk cat, but now you're starting to see some of the other clonotypes that are there present in the donor blood that we use. When we get down to 0.01%, it's very difficult now to pull out the jerk cat um, 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 sequence that we're looking at here. You can see now it's blended in the background, and now we're seeing more of the diversity that was contributed by the donor cells. When you look at a normal um, milliliter of blood out of most humans, you can see anywhere from 1,000 from to 10,000 different chronotypes that are there based on um, whether the person was um, healthy or sick and based on some other exposures to different types of, of uh, features. One of the interesting things about uh, looking at the T cell receptor and overlaying this with other parts of, parts of information is that this is a very important field that is emerging for a lot of researchers that are focusing on immune oncology. One of the things that we're doing at Kyogen is focusing not only on looking at the immune repertoire, but tying the immune repertoire into gene expression as well as looking at mutational burden. So one of the focuses in our immune oncology programs that we have here is to focus on overlaying different types of information. Today, we talked about looking at the immune repertoire by using our Kyoseq immune repertoire, RNA-seq T cell receptor panel. In the future, we'll present some data looking at both a gene expression uh, panel where we can look at immune oncology, which looks at checkpoint inhibitors and other types of gene expression um, and genes that drive tumor progression, as well as looking at the um, state of the T cells. And then we'll overlay this with looking at DNA mutations using a tumor mutation burden. Stay tuned for some more information as we get closer to uh, talking about these products. Lastly, I'd like to thank everybody for attending our presentation today. Um, I see that there's some questions here, so we'll jump into the question and answer session. And again, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Rilly, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. Now let's get started. Our first question is, how many reads do you recommend per sample? Uh, that's a very good question. 
we've tried to develop our kits to be as flexible as, as possible to suit a whole bunch of different research scenarios that you see in either the same lab or common labs that may be interested in collaborating. So for a discovery experiment where we're going through and we just want to see the top maybe 100 to 1,000 clones, then we might use a million reads per sample. For experiments where we want to take a deep dive into a sample and see all the clonotypes that are there, we might use anywhere from 5 to 10 million reads per sample. And what is the cost of the data analysis? Can I run my own analysis? So the cost of the data analysis is built into the cost of the kit. So it's basically free once you've bought the kit. If you want to run your own data analysis, using the GeneWeb web portal is very easy to use. You can log into the website to create yourself a space on there. Um, this is uh, free to do. And then once you upload your FASTQ data, you push a couple of buttons to say how you did the sequencing, uh, what instrument that you did, and which files you want to analyze, and it will start the process. And then when it's done, it will alert that you're done and you can download your report. If you want to run your own analysis, the analysis pipeline that we set up is um, it's very transparent on how we set it up. And we can assist you with um, understanding how we do the UMI demultiplexing. And then you could incorporate this into your own pipeline for your own results. In case you need to put this on your own servers for some sort of IT reason or, bio, or uh, IT security issues, or you would just like to go through and change some of the filters to take advantage of the sequencing data that you have. Are we able to match the alpha and beta receptors or delta and gamma receptors? This is a common question that we get when we're talking about using this particular kit. And unfortunately, we're not able to do any matched receptors. With this kit, we're focusing on looking at the immune repertoire, which is looking at the total diversity of a sample. In order to go through and to match alpha and beta or gamma and delta receptors, you often have to use a single cell kit and get down to the single cell level, sequence those out, and then by natural of having a single cell, you'll be able to match the receptors. And our last question, do you have any solutions to work with single cells from a fax sort? Oh, that's also a very good question. From a fax sort, we're typically going through and we can capture single cells. Um, once we have those single cells, we have developed out a kit that allows you to um, actually capture the entire transcriptome from that sample. We call the kit the Kyoseq FX single cell RNA kit. It starts with your cell. It undergoes a lysis of the cell. We amplify the RNA. Um, and we actually make cDNA and then amplify the cDNA. And once we made the cDNA, we build a library. From start to finish, it's about uh, three hours of time to build your library, and then you're on to sequencing. When you're using a sequencing uh, machine, it takes you usually um, overnight to get the data. And then for data analysis, you can typically run this through any sort of RNA sequencing pipeline, and you can focus on the T cell receptor sequences, as well as going through and understanding the gene expression or any other type of RNA sequencing um, data point you'd like to look at. Well, I would like to once again thank Dr. Ruley for his presentation. I'd also like to thank Kyogen for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January of 2019. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.